Good morning. <coughs> How is the essay writing going? <laughs> a bit like that. Um, I got a question about uh, <coughs> the exam the other day. Um, uh, what kind of uh, aids that you are allowed to use the exam and the answer is that you can use all written and printed material the exam so you can take with you the lecture notes your own notes um, all the readings <coughs> and whatever material you would like to use but uh, I <coughs> the um, questions will then reflect that you have all your printed and written material with you <laughs> in a way uh, it's not a good idea to start reading all the material on the exam day <laughs> you should be prepared but uh, <coughs> I don't think it will be too hard uh, anyway it, uh, it's just I'd, I like to give my exams uh, in a way that reflects what you will actually be doing in 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 real life uh, when you when you are s when you start working, then you will have uh, all the information that you can get your hand uh, hands on will be at your disposal when you are going to s solve something. Uh, the only thing that we we don't allow is is uh, is internet use and electronic devices which is a bit different from what you will experience in a job situation for practical reasons. Um, <coughs> next week we will have um, a lecture about air transport or air freight transport and then I will also spend some time on going through uh, some of some uh, exercises for the exam and uh, I will also post a couple of, uh, you have g gotten the 2007 exam on Frontier, but I will post a couple more exam sets for you <coughs> during um, or before next week. And then you can have a look, <coughs> then you can have a look at some of those exercises uh, during that, that lecture. I think I will perhaps spend a couple of hours on, uh, on air freight and then uh, we can spend one hour on solving exam or discussing exam exercises. Today I will talk uh, <coughs> about uh, land-based transport, intermodal transport. Um, well, it doesn't matter, does it? It's better to use the blackboard when, uh, when I have the light on. Yeah. Um <coughs> and um, I will also talk a bit about uh, about uh, uh, freight transport planning and some co um, challenges connected to that. Uh, these pictures are from uh, from a place nearby. It's a uh, it's a Rumstalen. Um, and these are the this is a train uh, carrying containers from Andalsnes to to the terminal at Alna outside Oslo. Uh, it used to be a, a regular service, a more dense uh, regular service uh, some years back um, with a collaboration between a, a big, uh, big freighter and, uh, and the national uh, rail transport company. Uh, but now uh, and, and that operation ceased <coughs> because it was not enough cargo available and it was or it was enough cargo available but there were, were some irregularities connected to the operations too much delays and too, m too many problems but then uh, a new <coughs> a new private freight company has started this uh, this service now so it's uh, quite exciting to see how it goes and that they will be able to, to, to be successful. Because there are some, some challenges connected to, to the regularity of, uh, of the railway. Uh, for the time being, it's closed 
for passenger transport. And I'm a bit uncertain, to be honest, about whether it is open for, uh, for, for freight. But it's uh, closed because of uh, the danger of, uh, of, uh, of rock slides, as you may have noticed. It's a big mountain that they expect to, or parts of it <coughs> are expected to, to slide and may hit uh, the railway. That's why it's closed now. But the road is open. So I will talk, talk about this, a bit about the characteristics of road transport, rail transport, intermodality. I will discuss uh, road rail competition in a, in, a, in a bit theoretical way, but I think it's a, it's a quite good example to show you some, some, some important characteristics of, of this competition. And that discussion is also valid for, uh, for C transport versus land transport, because it has to do with uh, different scale effects on the, on the different, different transport modes. And then I will, <coughs> I will wind up with some, some thoughts about freight transport planning. Just to show you how it, how it looks like, uh, the distribution between the various, uh, various transport modes. We are not dealing <coughs> too much with pipelines in this course. Uh, we're focusing on, on, on freight of, uh, of, let's say, classical, more or less, cargo. Uh, we could have included pipelines because it's important in, in some countries and for some types of, uh, of uh, goods, like uh, obvious example is oil and gas and also water. But, uh, but we, don't, uh, we don't deal with that. Coastal transport, <coughs> um, and this is uh, this is domestic and regional transports. Transport between countries within within a region, but not deep sea transport, meaning intercontinental transportation. Uh, <coughs> we have the inland waterways, which has some importance in the, in the EU. And also in uh, in the U.S., you have the Great Lakes, and uh, uh, as as a main main component of that, and then we have rail transport, <coughs> which is a big big industry in the, in the United States, and uh, and the road transport, which is the dominant part of the transportation within the EU. Uh, and as I have mentioned, EU is uh, quite keen on transferring some of that transport to to rail and uh, and short sea shipping. You have <coughs> seen perhaps pictures of the barges moving slowly along along the rivers in uh, within some of the EU countries, which is one important part of this short sea shipping industry. Here <coughs> you have uh, you have a very uh, strong component of this segment is uh, transcontinental shipments of uh, cargo from the from the east to the west coast. <coughs> the trains are uh, the good cargo is taken in from from Asia, from the east coast, and then they move slowly across the continent to the west coast. It's the opposite. Take it in on the west and then slowly on to the east. So that's, that's the way it is. Uh, I should know that because I have been standing uh, in a rented car waiting in 40 degrees centigrade, waiting for one of those trains to cross. It took half an hour. And I rented a cheap car, an old car without air condition, so it was hot. And they move a bit, of course, a bit faster than walking speed, but they move slowly because it's a lot of uh, lot of weight uh, that is transported, and uh, and the speed is, uh, is is quite low. So it's it's quite different from what you see in uh, in this country where the freight trains are moving 
approximately a bit slower than the passenger trains, but, uh, but still uh, much faster. This is uh, <coughs> the flow, how it looks like uh, to and from Norway. Uh, so the Norwegians uh, words here, but this is truck, ship, ferry. This is the international ferries and the rail. And we see that from uh <coughs> from um, from North Europe, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, of. Um, Exports and import uh, and imports with uh, with uh, or, or most of it goes by by truck, some with rail, and then sea transport. These two uh, segments. Uh, <coughs> moving a bit further, ship takes over quite a lot of the of the segment of imports and exports, and but still we have uh, trucks taking care of uh, of a rather large large segment and then <coughs> moving on to more distant uh, origins and destinations sea transport is more or less the dominant except for this one then so this is a global global freight where of course uh, apart from Europe some is taken by truck but most of it by, s by sea so this is uh <coughs> it's quite important when we when we're trying to discuss let's say policies for uh, for for servi serving the freight transport industry I'll come back to some of it some of you are writing about cabotage and I'll talk a bit about that later on uh how we can make this uh, this efficient and what type of segment you're trying to address here and then it's important to have an overview of uh, what is uh, what is actually going on. And uh, these flows can be broken down onto various types of cargo, perishables, uh, whether it's bulk transport, container transport, and so on and so forth. <laughs> but when you come down to the specific flow from A to B, from from Molde to Oslo, or from Oslo to wherever in the world, it's much more difficult to have an exact overview of what is actually transported. We'll come back to that a bit later on, but it's, it's, <coughs> it's, it's private information, and it's uh, possessed by the companies, by the, by the freight owners, and partly the, 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 the fre freighting companies, and they are not willing to reveal it because they, th they see it as, uh, as, uh, as sensitive to, to competition. They don't want to, they won't want to expose their, their market to their competitors. This is uh, <coughs> distribution of ton kilometers development over time for sea, rail, and road. <coughs> and this is also relevant for, uh, for, uh, for policy discussions. Because if you, you can here recognize that sea transport has, uh, sorry, road transport has, has grown quite a lot since uh, over the last, let's say, 30 years. Whereas, and the same for, uh, for uh, for sea transport, it has leveled a bit off recently, but that has to do with the with the credit <coughs> crunch or the financial crisis in 2008. Rail transport has not gained much of uh, of of this, uh, or have not increased much of their activity in the market. A bit, but not much. So many. <coughs> Many, uh, let's say, policymakers they they think that the rail transport I is is underutilized when it comes to to, to freight transport. And road is the dominant for it's it's the largest one uh, followed by rail. So this is uh, one of the reasons why you have all these EU attempt attempts within the EU to transfer cargo from uh, from road to rail. They 
it is considered as being more environmental friendly. Yes. Well, <laughs> it's whether it is to it's it's a bit increased here. As uh, as uh, well, that's a good question. The overall volume has decreased, and it seems like road transport has has increased slightly. I have no good answer to that. It might might be that. Uh, there has been a substitution effect in, uh, in some way between uh, imported goods and goods that are, uh, let's say, has an origin within. This is, uh, this is for Norway, I have to s say that. And Norway was not that badly affected by the credit crisis, credit crunch. That is one explanation. Because <coughs> Norway was, in a to to very l little extent, hit by the credit crunch, whereas uh, uh, globally it hit quite strongly. So it may might be that there is a substitution effect between imports and some and domestic activities that can explain it. But it is interesting. I have no clear answer. Apart from the fact that. Uh, that we, uh, this country was uh, quite, quite lucky in terms of having, being in possession of all the oil and gas resources and, uh, and things like that. I can try to work it out, but I, uh, I have no clear answer as I, as for, for the time being. Now, <coughs> uh, this is showing the competition between a road, a road, rail, and sea transport. Competition with rail, uh, competition with road transport for rail and ship, and railways with direct access to, let's say, the, uh, the origin and or destination for the, for the cargo. Um, there this, this table is based on a cost comparison and there is a this <coughs> these numbers gives the trade off in distance where the it's a minimum distances of competitive transport chains against direct road transport different types of of cargo temperature controlled goods reefer transports General cargo, manufactured goods, dry bulk, timber, and wet bulk. Different alternatives to road transport. And here is the distances. So we see uh, distances above 550 kilometers. 450 kilometers for uh, for ship. It's it's better to use or or cheaper in terms of, uh, of freight costs to use uh, ship rail. And whether it is convenient to use ship versus rail depends, of course, of where the goods are, are, are heading. Um, I mean, the origin and destination of the, of, the, of the goods. I mean, you need to have a railway for this to be relevant if you, if you plan this. <coughs> this is um, general cargo, and you have to remember here that in for these two, you have a short car transport or uh, or um, truck transport uh, at each end of the transport chain. So we are comparing then truck. And then, uh, and then uh, a rail link, and then a truck uh, again from the terminal and to the co customer, to the end customer. And the same here. But here we com compare truck 
it should be truck, not car, but uh, truck all the way. So, uh, so, uh, and and the same here for uh, for manufactured goods, for dry bulk and wet bulk, we are not considering a truck transport on the on the feeding on the feeding links. Here we have assumed that we have uh, door to door transport of of these heavy bulk transports so you don't you, you will normally not like to take them on <coughs> on a truck apart from very short distances dry bulk includes let's say sand and gravel and uh, all that kind of things which you see of course being transported by truck on shorter distances but on long distances you would like to use uh, use uh, rail or ship just to give you an idea of of the trade-offs. On longer distances, it's often good to to transfer to uh, to uh, to other modes than road transport. But this is from a purely pure cost perspective. <coughs> Measuring distances, calculating costs. But does that tell the whole picture, do you think? Are there more to it than just costs? Some of you are dealing with this in your uh, assignments. This problem of uh, what type of transport is most feasible from uh, transporting a given amount of cargo from a of, of a specific type from A to B. What more could be, <coughs> what other components are determining the choice of transport mode, do you think? Time. Yes. Flexibility. Not to mention flexibility, which is, uh, which is highly important. Um, and flexibility uh, is uh, when you can, you can order a truck transport let's say the day before, and you can get your goods shipped out on a full truckload at best. Whereas <coughs> the, the opposite or the possibility of using a ship, then the need to wait for all the other cargo owners to, let's say, or, the, or all the other car cargo to, to or, the, or the remaining demand, uh, sorry, you, sorry, the, the remaining supply of cargo to fill the ship, and that can take time. Then that's when time also comes into, into play here, because uh, the lead time for filling, filling a ship can be quite high. I got a story from one of the local producers of, uh, of cranes for, uh, for offshore supply and uh, for um, for um, drilling platforms they were going to ship <coughs> ship this crane to somewhere and for once they they wanted to ship it out in one piece and using a ship and they uh, they made uh, they got this crane from uh, from the factory and down to the to the port, and they lifted it on board the ship. And the ship was uh, empty, apart from this crane, and you could see it down in a corner of the of the room that you could use for uh, for the cargo. There was nothing nothing else there. So so it's uh, so a ship can take a quite a lot of volume and weight. And it takes often quite a lot of time when you have thin markets. And Norway is a sparsely populated country in most regions, and hence road transport tends to be the winner. It's not much uh, railways here either, so that's why road transport is a big, big player in, in this country. 
So it's a combination of time and flexibility. Um, other aspects that could determine the choice of transport mode? The environment? Yes. And as I, <coughs> as I said, if you have included the true costs <coughs> of using fossil fuel in the transport costs, then this should be a the environment cost should be included in the in the in the um, trade-offs here. But for uh, for sea transport, they are only partly included. For road transport, they are to a certain extent, I, I would say, large extent included as far as. Uh, we talk just about environmental costs. For air transport, <coughs> as we'll deal with, next, deal with next time, they are almost almost no environmental costs are paid for uh, for uh, jet fuel. So that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, air transport has uh, is underpriced when it comes to transportation. Other aspects? Uh, yes. Could be an issue. Um, there are examples of uh, Norwegian trucks with uh, dry cod to Italy, which has been hijacked in, uh, in uh, somewhere in in Italy, because uh, dry cod has a very high value, and uh, it's uh, it's often, I mean, truck transport is kind of, uh, it's more difficult to, to, to secure that types of transports, perhaps, which are more individual, individually based, you have many vehicles. Uh, as compared to ships and, and trains, where there may be more organized uh, ways of handling security issues. But there is, there is one more which could be important. I have mentioned it already, actually. And hmm? Yes, reliability. Because uh, <coughs> the problem with the, with the local rail service going from Andalsnes, taking cargo to Oslo, one of the main problems was just uh, was, was reliability. Uh, they did manage to, to, to keep the time schedules for some reasons. Um, there are, if you compare a transport chain with a car or a truck taking the cargo from uh, origin to destination. You load and you unload, and that's it. If you are going to have a, a transport chain with a truck, then a ship, and then a truck again, or truck, rail truck, you have four points where you handle the cargo. Two terminals or breakpoints, and then the origin and the destination. So the, the so the the probability that something could go wrong along the way is higher. Uh, delays can occur. Goods can get uh, lost in some way, uh, and so on. So there are there are problems, but it has not only to do with cost minimization. As such need to, to take other other aspects into consideration as well. Uh, we have studied, uh, there was a study here uh, on, uh, on uh, dry cod, this example, from northern Norway to, to Italy, where the costs of using road transport is much higher and using uh, other transport modes. Could take it by rail or by sea. 
but it's not done. It's only uh, trucks are used. And they could use sea transport and even, and uh, there is a coastal line going once a week, which could have taken those, uh, the, the dry cod, but because dry cod is not critical when it comes to, it's not that critical at least when it comes to temperature and, and lead time. Because when you dry the fish, it can stand quite a long uh, lead time before it is consumed. It's a way of conserving or preserving the, the fish. But still, truck transport is used. And the main explanation behind that has to do with uh, uncertainty. If you, if you introduce uncertainty, uh, and that includes time, because I, I, you could say that if you, in f more physical terms, this fish can stand a longer lead time because it is preserved, but uh, the customers, they want it anyway to, to um, on a, at a specific time because they need to plan for distribution to the, to the supermarkets and, uh, and their customers again, which, which needed this fish in some kind of production. So, so still, uh, lead time is, uh, is a factor, even if it's not tr that critical, uh, as if you compare it to, uh, to um, let's say, fresh salmon or other types of fish, which needs to be taken quite fast to the, to the markets. Well, this is again uh, the growth in, uh, in, uh, in freight transport forecasted quite a long way into the future, to 2060, almost. And this is sea transport, <coughs> this is rail, and this is road transport. And the index year is 2010 with an index of 100. So we see that if you are engaged into capacity planning, not necessarily capacity on the, on the truck or the ship or the, or, the, or the train, but on ports and roads, railways, seaports, and the infrastructure that is involved in, uh, in production of these transport services, you need to have long-term forecasts. Because you don't build a terminal like this, it takes many, many years to, to plan and to, to implement a project like that. But we see here that there is a, a, a one and a half time at least volume for, uh, for, uh, for uh, rail, almost or more than two times uh, for road transport and, uh, and less for, but still a significant growth for, for rail transport, transport, or sea transport, sorry. This is rail, road, and sea. A bit less for sea transport. And if you then, yes? Is this with the current situation of the catbarge and um, fuels? This is with the current situation of, uh, of cabotage. Um, and it's also with, a, with the current situation of trade regulations, because that has an impact on, uh, on this. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on, uh, on current freight costs, but with an increased uh, price of carbon dioxide emissions over the years. That is included in, in, in these models. But um, apart from that, it's, it is uh, based on more or less current state of, of affairs. Um, but what we can see from this is that terminal capacity which is uh, today it is uh, it's, uh, 
lack of terminal capacity in, in the central Oslo area, for instance, if we talk about Norwegian conditions. This is valid also for, for, for many other countries. We need to address that closely, and there is, a, there is a quite a lot of fighting going on at the moment about terminal locations. There are discussions in, uh, in, in Stavanger, there's discussion in Bergen, and in Trondheim, and in Oslo. And I guess we have the same situation also in other, other countries. And the reasons for those discussions is, is forecast like this. Forecast like this. The, <laughs> the awkward thing about forecasts is that you never know whether they will be fulfilled or not. And you need to be very careful about whether you should plan for this situation and take all the investments in one go, or whether you should take, take them step by step. And try to organize the investments in the terminals and in other types of fixed infrastructure so that you can, you can try to level off the investment, uh, the, the amount of investments if these curves are becoming more, let's say, that they be flattens out instead of, of having this increase. So to, to think in terms of stepwise investments <coughs> where you can uh, cancel uh, some of them if, if the market doesn't develop like this, it's, it's, it's very important. I am engaged now in, in, uh, in um, assessments of the airport capacity in the Oslo Fjord area. I'm working with that at the moment uh, as a project. And uh, we have the same curves, optimistic, one could say, for air transport. A very strong growth. Today, the Oslo Main Airport has some uh, 23, 24 passenger movements per year. And it is expected to grow to around 60 within 20, I think it's within 2050 or something. A doubling. And that is. Uh, of course, a very important piece of information when you are going to plan for uh, for investments and expan expansions of, of the airports. Uh, then the question is, where should you take the expansion? Should you expand Oslo Airport or should you expand some of the other airports in the area instead? Will that be cheaper? Could that give a larger amount of investment flexibility and things like that? So those curves, those Type, this type of information is, is very important for, for planning of the terminals, ports, seaports, roads, railways, so on. But it's not that important for, let's say, the rolling stock the number of aircraft, the number of uh, trains, or the number of uh, trucks that you need for, uh, for producing the transport service, because that can be varied in a on a quite short notice. It's a more short-term decisions that, uh, that are needed in that case. So it's easy to adjust that in the, in the long run, even if you have some issues connected to the big types of, uh, let's say, big ships and things like that. But, but even, even they have a much shorter lifespan uh, than, um, than the infrastructure. So as a planner, you, you are dependent on, on this kind of, uh, of information. Then we move on to, to, the, to truck transport. And uh, I think uh, I'll just go through this before we, we, before we break. They are 
playing a very important role as, as uh, let's say, the f feeding into intermodal transport networks to move cargo to the terminal for consolidation. Uh, and also having the distribution to the final customers. Truck transport, what characterizes truck transport? If you talk, if you think about the market, and uh, is it a competitive market, or is it a, is it a oligopolized or monopolized market, or what do you think about that? This industry, trucking industry. the market structure. It's important for you as a customer when you're going to order a shipment from, from A to B. How, how, is this, how does it look like, this market? It's many players. It's one of the, it's one of the most competitive industries that we have within the transport sector. <laughs> there are not many of them left, to be honest, uh, of the competitive parts of the transport industry, I mean. Because there are few players within rail, few players within uh, at least parts of the, of the shipping market. Some exemptions for, uh, for uh, short-haul bulk transports, where you have some, a fleet of old ships which are competing quite strongly with each other. But the bigger ships, and we have had this discussion about the, con the big container shipping lines, there were only three or four left. Um, but within the trucking industry, there are lots of, let's say, in uh, people running one truck or a couple of trucks, uh, as a, let's say, company with couple of employees, and they are competing quite strongly. But there are some changes going on there as well, because they, they tend to have, let's say, uh, companies like uh, Kühn & Nagel, uh, Schenker, which are big, and they organize a fleet of trucks but there are then um, individual truck owners that are, uh, are operating under contracts with the big, uh, let's say, third-party third logistics providers like, uh, like these two I mentioned. So there is a movement of power in this industry from the individual owners and to the big third-party logistics companies. So they, the individual truck owners, they compete for the contracts with the big 3PL companies. Uh, but on, on the 3PL level, there are a limited number of, of, of players. So even in this trucking industry, there are some changes that is going on which has gone on for, let's say, not that long, maximum of 10 years. So there are, uh, there are important uh, things that goes on within this industry as well, which is normally considered as being atomized, meaning many small players and large amount of competition. Well, I think we break. Now, let me continue.